Dennis McKenzie, in his book, The Encyclopedia of Biblical Errancy, said this on page 313. If one were to accept the Bible as God's Word and believe that heaven awaited those who gained entrance, one could never know for sure what must be done in order to reach heaven. The Bible, he says, is just too vague, too nebulous, too contradictory for even those who seek to follow its advice. This is because Scripture clearly outlines different methods by which one can be saved and the different methods are often either mutually exclusive, divergent, or contradictory. Allegedly, the Bible writers made mistakes even in answering the question about how to get to heaven, how to please God and be saved, answering the question of salvation, what must I do to be saved? Notice this question that some have asked. Is salvation a gift from God? Is it a gift from God or is it the result of what a person does? Is it the result of obedience in any way? It's very clear in Scripture, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, that we are saved by the grace of God. It's been given to us. Paul said, I thank my God always concerning, concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Paul said in that same epistle in chapter 15, verse 57, that God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we remember the verse, most likely, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then you may recall uh, Paul's letter to Titus in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. According to His mercy. According to the grace of God, He saved us. Now, why is it, if we are saved by the grace of God, if salvation is a gift from God, why is it, for example, you see where God speaks to the rich young ruler, where Jesus, who is God in the flesh, speaks to the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, after, uh, after he was asked the question by the rich young ruler, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Why is it that when that question was asked, that Jesus said there was something for him to do? Why is it that Jesus ultimately said, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross, take up the cross and follow me. Jesus said there was something to do. He didn't say, you don't have to do anything. He didn't say, there's nothing at all for you to do. It's, it's simply a gift. You have to do nothing to accept it. You know, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, what must I do to be saved? What was their response? Was it, there's absolutely nothing for you to do. To be saved. No, they gave a response in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You recall that Jesus said in Luke 13, verses 3 through 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 47, Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Is repenting an action? Is that something that people do? It certainly is, and it's something that's not normally easy to do. I mean, it's difficult to stop doing those things, to be sorry for the wrong things that we've done, to stop doing them. And then notice what the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 26 and verse 20. Jesus had sent Paul to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 26, verse 18, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. But notice this. Paul went to the Gentiles, and he was instructing them to, quote, repent, turn to God, and notice this, and do works of repentance. So the Apostle Paul, he was preaching about, the, about, receiving, about receiving the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, the greatest thing, the gospel message, the greatest thing you could really contemplate on and, and preach about. But then he went there instructing them to repent, turn to God, and do works of repentance. Well, how are all of these verses and others that we don't have the time to go over, how are they not contradictory? How can it be a gift and then there also be something for you to do? Well, to better understand the relationship between God's gifts and what man does to receive those gifts, it's very helpful, I believe, to consider one particular gift from God that is mentioned more times in the Old Testament than any other thing that God has ever said to have given. Now, we're not under the old law today. I was not born under the old law. I've never lived under it. It is not for me. It was for a particular time period, for a particular 
people, but that law has been done away with. Jesus nailed it to the cross, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. So we are not under the old law, but we can learn something from the Old Testament. And one thing we can learn is the gift that God gave and that is talked about as being given by God more than any other gift in the Old Testament, and that is the gift of the land of Canaan. Over a period of nearly 500 years, from the time of Abraham to the time of Joshua, God repeatedly promised to give this land to the children of Israel. It was a gift. There's absolutely no doubt about, about it being a gift. It was clearly a gift, repeated numerous times. For example, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. You can read it in Genesis 13, 15, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 8, and other places that God said to your descendants, to Abraham's descendants, He would give this land. In Exodus chapter 6 and verse 8, you read, I will bring you into this land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 34. When you come into the land which I give you as a possession. Are we, are we getting the point here? The land of Canaan was a gift. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 2. Uh, the Israelites, they were to send men to spy out the land of Canaan which God said He was giving to the children of Israel. Now, it was a gift. It was clearly a gift. There's no doubt about it. They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. It was a gift. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 and also verse 23. Moses wrote, When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which He swore to your fathers, we've already read some of those verses, to give you, large and beautiful cities, notice this, which you did not build, houses full of good things, full of all good things, which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Notice this, He brought us out from there that He might bring us in to give us the land of which He swore to our fathers. Make no mistake about it. The land of Canaan was a gift. But Israel had to take the gift. Israel had to accept it. There was something, listen clearly, there was something that they had to do in order to receive this gift. Numbers chapter 13 verse 30, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession of for we are well able to overcome it. He said, take possession. Well, what was involved in them taking possession of this land? Well, you can read Numbers 13 too. They spied out the land. They prepared provisions, Joshua chapter 1 verse 11. They had to cross the Jordan River, Joshua 3. They had to march around the city of Jericho once a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day, blow trumpets and shout and utterly destroy all that was in Jericho. They had to battle the inhabitants of Ai. They had to do a, a variety of things. They chased and struck down the inhabitants of the southern part of Canaan, Joshua chapter 10. They battled their way up the uh, northern part of Canaan and took possession of it, Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 15, and chapter 15, 13 through 19. After Caleb said, Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke, Joshua blessed him and gave him. Hebron to Caleb. Still, Caleb had to drive out the giant descendants of Anak and take the land. So I think maybe we're getting the point here that there is a gift, and in particular this is the gift in the Old Testament referred to more than any other gift. It's a good case study, but Israel had to take it. Joshua 21 verse 43, The Lord gave to Israel all the land of which He had sworn to give to the fathers, to their fathers, so it was a gift. And they took possession of it. They took possession of it. God gave the Israelites freedom from Egypt, freedom from Egyptian bondage, but they still had to put forth some effort walking from Egypt across the Red Sea and into the wilderness of Shur. Israel didn't earn Canaan, but they still had to exert uh, uh, quite a bit of effort in possessing it. They had to do something. God gave the Israelites the city of Jericho, Joshua 6, 2. The walls of Jericho fell down by the power of God, but it did so, the walls fell down after they followed His instructions and encircled the city for seven days, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30. 
So it's a gift given by the grace of God, by the power of God, but it must be received. There is something to do. Israel didn't deserve manna from heaven. It was a free gift from God. Still, if they wanted to eat it, they were required to put forth effort in gathering. So let's remember and emphasize this important biblical truth that is not contradictory and that many people have seemed to overlook. But when you read Scripture, you see it very clearly time and time and time again. And it is applied also to receiving the gift of salvation. And it's this. Something can be a gift from God, even though conditions must be met in order for that gift to be received. We have a, a number of people in our studio here today, and none of you deserves this $20 that I have in my back pocket, that I have pulled out. None of you deserves this. I mean, I love you all, and I appreciate you being here today, but you didn't do anything to earn this. But if Aaron Reynolds would like to have this $20 bill, he's going to have to come up here, and he's going to have to shake my hand, and then he can receive it. Aaron, do you want this $20? Okay. Well, if you keep sitting there, you're not going to get it. So Aaron doesn't get it, you see, because he's remaining seated. So I'm going to keep this gift because he is continuing to sit. Now, is it there? Is it available to him? Would I like to give it to him? I love Aaron Reynolds. I think that, that he's a great guy and he would use this wisely and I would love to give it to him. But I'm not going to give it to him unless he gets up and takes it. You see, there would be something that he would have to do. Now, that may be a feeble illustration to illustrate the point that God gives us things. He gives us a variety of things. He gives us our new days. He gives us family. He gives us food. He uh, gives us salvation. At least it is made available to us. But it must be received. The spiritual promised land is given to all who will take it. Revelation 22:17 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Christians are those who have received Christ Jesus the Lord. And having received Him, we walk in Him. Colossians 2 and verse 6. So you have to receive salvation. There is something that must be done. Now, like Aaron, not deserving, if you will, that $20, he didn't do anything to get it if he decided to receive it. None of us deserves salvation. None of us could ever do meritorious works in order to merit salvation. That would be maybe similar to me saying, I would like to give you uh, a million trillion pounds of gold. Or I would like to give you more gold than is available on earth. Let's just assume there is gold on the moon and there's gold on Mars and there's gold on Jupiter. And let's say I'm going to give you all the gold in our solar system. Now, let's say in order to receive that, you need to come to the office and do a few things. You need to do this in order to receive it. Now, there's no way you could ever do enough to earn that amount of gold. But I may put some stipulations on how you are to receive it. I want you to receive it in a particular way. Well, God has revealed to us in Scripture and not in a contradictory way how to receive salvation. It is not by meritorious works. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. But it is by taking action, by doing what God said to do in order to receive the gift of salvation. Well, what exactly has God said to do to receive salvation? Three times in the book of Acts, Luke records for us non-Christians asking what they needed to do to be saved. And all three times, a different answer was given. How is this not a contradiction? How is it that this is not an inconsistency? How can you have three different answers given to the same question? Well, you might want to look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, as well as Acts chapter 22 and verse 10. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, you see where those on the day of Pentecost asked Peter and the apostles a question. And what they asked him after they heard the gospel that they preached, they asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Again, please notice, contrary to what a lot of people in the denominational world say, Peter did not say, well, you can't do anything because it's just a gift. You don't do anything to receive it. There is nothing to be done in an obedient way. Not at all. Notice that Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38. Well, then you have this question again in Acts chapter 16, where again the uh, Philippian jailer, where he asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, verse 30. Well, again, verse 31 that we've already read says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So they were to believe or the, the jailer was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have the Apostle Paul who before he was an apostle, he had met the Lord. The Lord, you might say, introduced himself to Saul on the road to Damascus. And in Acts chapter 22, Paul was recounting this story as he was preaching and speaking to a mob who were not very happy with him. And he was talking about how he saw Jesus and Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Jesus said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. That is Acts chapter 22 and verse 8. And then Saul at this point in time, in verse, in verse uh, let's see, right here in verse 10, he says, what shall I do? Well, the Lord didn't say. I mean, if you want to know what to do, just listen to what Jesus said to do. And uh, contrary to what a lot of people are saying today about salvation, both skeptics and also people in the denominational world who are teaching error on this subject, Jesus did not say, oh, there is nothing for you to do. You just wait and receive Jesus and, and everything will be okay. There was actually something for Saul to do. Saul was told something to do right here in verse 10. Jesus said, Arise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do, including receiving the gift of salvation. What was the Apostle Paul, who at this time was Saul, what was he told to do? Well, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, he was told by Ananias to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. One question, three different answers. How is this not a contradiction? The reason that different answers were given to the same question is because the hearers, the audiences, were at different places on the road to salvation. Now, this rationality, and it is very rational that different answers at different times would be given to different people. I believe this can be clearly illustrated by things and conversations we may have with people about other subjects. For example, if a friend called me and said, Eric, I'm, uh, I'm in Jackson, Tennessee, and I want to know how far it is from Jackson, Tennessee to where some of your relative, relatives live in, uh, in Neosho, Missouri. And so I answer his question, how, how far away is this? Well, uh, it would be 475 miles or thereabout, if I remember correctly. I've made that trip along I-40 a few times. Well, what if my friend then calls me the next day, and he's in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he says, Erica, how far is it from here to, to Neosho? And I say, well, you're, you're about 260 miles from Neosho. Is, is my answer correct? It's a different answer. Is it correct? Well, yes, it is. Why? Because he was at different places when he asked the question. If later, later on, let's say that day, he called me from Fort Smith and he said, Eric, I'm, I'm in Fort Smith. Uh, how far is it to Neosho? And I say, well, it's, a, it's 130 miles. Well, you see, no fair, rational person would accuse me of contradicting myself since the questions were asked from different reference points. Three different answers were given, but all three were correct. Likewise, in the New Testament, when you see different answers given to the same question, what must I do to be saved? What shall I do? Well, it was because they were at different points on the road to salvation. Let's say, for example, that someone who claims to be a Muslim, they come to you and they want to know uh, about salvation. Well, it would be very appropriate to tell them, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you cannot be saved. You need to believe in Jesus. That would be the first, maybe most appropriate thing to say, teaching him about Jesus. There would be no reason at early on to, to tell that person necessarily about repentance and confession of Christ and uh, immersion in water. You'll probably deal with confessing Christ as you talk to him about believing in Christ. But you may not talk to him about some of these other things because there would be no point 
in immersing a Muslim who does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it would be appropriate at different times. If you're talking to someone who already believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who's, who's made that confession, and let's say they're willing to repent, you, you, will, you realize they're, they're willing to change their lives to live for Christ, it might be then very appropriate to deal with the subject of immersion in water. We need to remember the role of supplementation when learning about salvation. We've dealt with this principle of supplementation and how supplementation does not equal, is not equivalent to contradiction. We need to remember that principle as we apply it to salvation and what we must do in order to be saved. I mean, think about supplementation. Let's say that if you only took one passage about the genealogy of Christ and you didn't think about the other passages of Scripture about the genealogy of Christ, if you only took Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, you might think that Jesus was the immediate son of David rather than being a descendant of David separated in time by about a thousand years. If that was the only verse you read in your Bible about the genealogy of Christ. But you see, you read that verse in conjunction with all of the other verses about the genealogy of Christ to get the full picture, to understand the entirety of truth on that particular subject. Let's say that Romans 3 verse 23 was the only verse that you read about sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And let's say that you ignored the context of Romans chapter 3 and you disregarded the rest of the New Testament. Then you might come to the conclusion that Jesus sinned. But you see, once you take that verse and you look at it in its entire biblical context, you realize it is not saying that Jesus sinned, but all others who've reached the age of accountability other than Jesus have sinned. We think about this and we apply this, the idea of supplementation and taking the entirety of the subject, the holistic approach, and we use this in everyday life. We see it, for example, with uh, football referees. Should football referees just hone in on one or two uh, rules in a rule book and then go out and try to referee a football game effectively? Well, how, how silly would that be if the, if the only rule they knew was, well, they can't go out of this line, but they can do anything else? If a truck driver only learned the rule in a truck driving manual that they have to drive on the right side of the road, and that's the only rule they ever learned, how chaotic would our roads be. You see, people generally understand the need to learn the entire rule book, to learn the entire driver's manual. Knowing just a part of these things will result in chaos and negative consequences. Well, the same thing is true about God's Word. Taking only a part of God's Word to the neglect of the rest of His Word is a recipe for confusion and disaster since the entirety of God's Word is truth. Now, most Bible students seem to understand the importance of the holistic approach when it comes to a variety of subjects, but when it comes to salvation, all of a sudden we want to hone in on one passage. Maybe someone wants to use John 3.16, like I was talking to a gentleman a few years ago. He said, this is all the Bible I need, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he was saying, this is all I need. I need no other verses. This is all I need to do to be saved. But what about the other passages of Scripture? Number one, that passage is not being observed in its context because Jesus had already told Nicodemus earlier there was something for him to do. Except he is born again, born of water and the Spirit. He would not enter into the kingdom of God. He's not contradicting himself a few verses later in chapter 3 and verse 16. Well, what about 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21? Reading from the King James Version, Peter wrote, By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, before He ascended up, in, up into heaven, He gave His disciples the Great Commission. And He connected you might say, John 3, 16 and 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Not that 1 Peter 3, 21 was written yet, but the idea of believing and being immersed into Christ, he connected those two together saying, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Some like to emphasize the last part where Jesus said, he who does not believe will be condemned. But you see, there's no point for Jesus, there, there was no point for Jesus to put baptism again in that verse because... If you do not believe, you're not going to get immersed into Christ. It would be, uh, it, it would be unnecessary for us to say, if you 
eat food and digest it, you will likely be healthy. But if you do not eat food and do not digest that food, you see, it would be unnecessary to say digest that food again on that, that second time around, you might say. All you need to say is if you don't eat food, you're going to die. You're not going to be healthy. You're going to need some energy. Well, Jesus connected both baptism and belief, belief and baptism right there in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. We need to remember the role of supplementation when learning about salvation. The Bible teaches, John chapter 8, verse 24, you must believe in Jesus. If you don't, you're going to die in your sins and be separated from God eternally. Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus said, we are to, you must repent or you're going to perish. We must confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. We must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. God expects us to receive the gift of salvation the way He says to receive it. It's not done meritoriously. It's not done by merit. You can never earn salvation. It is impossible to earn it, but it must be received obediently as God said to receive it. It must be something you must do. The Bible teaches us what we must do. It teaches us a variety of things that must be done in order to receive the gift of salvation. And then once we receive it, once we become a Christian, we are to continue to obey Him. We are to live faithfully. That's not earning our salvation. That is being obedient to the King of Kings, to the Christ, to the Messiah who came and died for us and paid a debt that we could never pay. There are a lot of questions that people ask about salvation. Let me just go over one other one very briefly. Some might say, well, Eric, you, you've stressed the point of immersion in water a few times, but I remember reading in Luke chapter 23 about that thief on the cross, the thief who, who was penitent, and he was not baptized. And so doesn't that contradict other passages that say that you must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. I've spoken with many about Jesus and the thief on the cross. Many have asked questions about this very subject. It's a fair question to ask, but I believe, first of all, the question is asked based upon an assumption. How do we know that the thief was not baptized? Notice that this thief knew something about Jesus and His kingdom. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realized that Christ had a kingdom. He realized that the kingdom would be established after his death and that Jesus had the power to bless him. It is more than likely that this thief had heard the preaching of Jesus or John the baptizer previously. I mean, John had baptized multitudes. Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. John chapter 4, verse 1. Some try to skirt the, the issue of baptism by saying the thief on the cross wasn't baptized, but how do you know? Have you ever heard of a thief who previously had been baptized. I was teaching in a prison one time to a, a group of prisoners and this question came up. And when I asked that question, have you ever heard of a thief who had previously been baptized, they all laughed because they were very well aware that there had been people who had been immersed in Christ who had become thieves. But it may be that he wasn't immersed in, and he was never baptized. That, that may be the case. But here's another point that must be considered that really the question is the wrong question. It's like asking, how was David? How was Daniel? How was Ezra saved? Well, they lived under the old law prior to Jesus' last will and testament went into effect at his death. The thief lived under that same law. He lived under the old law and was being forgiven by Jesus Christ of his sins under that law. New Testament baptism had not yet come into effect until the death of the testator, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. Jesus wasn't dead yet when He forgave the sins of the thief on the cross. The Great Commission had not yet been given when Jesus gave His uh, promise to the thief that that day He would see Him in paradise. The thief did not know Mark 16, 16, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. He did not know Acts 2, 38. These commands were not given to the world, weren't given to the thief on the cross, because Christ had not yet died. It wasn't given until after the thief's death. The thief on the cross is not an example of how sinners this side of the cross are saved. To go back before Jesus, to go back before His death, and attempt to find out how to be saved is folly. The Bible tells us we must rightly divide the truth, and that is not rightly dividing the truth, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. 
We've had a class, we've had a series of lessons in this class on is the Bible reliable? And as we conclude, I want to read a poem that is titled simply The Anvil, written by John Clifford several years ago, many years ago. He said, Last eve I passed beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, he said. Then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought of the anvil of God's word. For ages skeptics' blows have beat upon, yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed. The hammer's gone. The belief that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God is not based upon wishful thinking but upon the reasonable examination of the facts. As we have seen thus far in this series, in all of these ten lessons, when a person takes a little time and effort to analyze the allegations skeptics have made and continue to make concerning the Bible, concerning Scripture, concerning the 66 books right here, the truth becomes evident. The Bible and the God of the Bible are innocent of the charges levied against them. Like the blacksmith's anvil, which wears out many hammers, but, but itself remains unaffected, over time the Bible wears out the skeptics' innocuous charges, all the while remaining unscathed. Oh, the attacks keep coming. But when Scripture is rightly divided and fairness and common sense are included in the interpretation of Scripture, the honest-hearted person will see that the Bible is the Word of God. It is the ever-enduring, inspired, inerrant Word of God. I am so appreciative of you all joining us in this series of lessons on Is the Bible Reliable? I would also like to make mention that you can find out a lot more information about the reliability of the Bible and answering various alleged discrepancies by going to the Apologetics Press website, apologeticspress.org. There in the top left hand uh, corner of the website, you're going to read a, or see a button there titled Alleged Discrepancies. And you can click on those buttons and you can click on the Old Testament, you can click on the New Testament, you can click on various books of the Bible and you can then see various verses under those books of the Bible that you can click on and see articles of some of the questions, some of the questions that we've been over in this series and many, many others. I hope that you'll make use of that tool. You also may be interested in the books, The Anvil Rings, Volumes 1 and 2 that deal with a number of alleged Bible discrepancies. Thank you again for being with us. I pray that this has been a blessing to you and will be a blessing to those who view it in the future. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.